Welcome to a Rice University Digital Media Production. For more information about us, please visit our website at www.rice.edu. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this rather chilly day. What we were really hoping for was a crisp New England autumn sort of clone day, but, and we thought it was going to be that, but it turned out to be a little bit drearier. So we're going to move quickly here so you don't get cold and you can warm up afterwards at the reception over there. Uh, I'm Susan McIntosh, the director of Ciencia, and what we've asked each speaker to do today is to focus on one idea that has particularly engaged them uh, in the course of their lives or careers. It doesn't need to be about their research and to speak about it in no more than five minutes, which is not as easy as you might think to do something focused and complete in five minutes. And I want to thank our four wonderful speakers for accepting this challenge. So let us proceed then without any lengthy introductions or Q&A afterwards. It's just the five minute talks, but please do then stay and talk with our speakers and with each other, mingle and chat afterwards at the reception. Um, our first speaker today is Tom Killian, talking on the pursuit for total control. Okay, I'm going to use my five minutes today to discuss an idea that guides my research and has been central to uh, atomic and optical physics. And the idea I want to talk about is the pursuit of total control of atoms and light. This curious preoccupation has led to great discoveries and technological advances like magnetic resonance imaging, the laser, and incredibly precise atomic clocks. And today, it still drives people like me to explore the bizarre laws of quantum mechanics and create the coldest stuff in the universe. Let's start with techniques to control the internal constituents of atoms. Multiple Nobel Prizes in the middle of the 20th century were given for discovering how to manipulate atomic nuclei with magnets and radio waves. This taught us about the internal structure of the atom but it also laid the groundwork for our ability to map muscle, brain, connective tissue, and tumors through magnetic resonance imaging. In this procedure, the hydrogen nuclei in water are set spinning like tiny tops. This may sound like a parlor trick, but the signals radiated by those spinning tops carry detailed information about the tissue environment. This story has played out many times. Atomic physicists develop a new control technique and it enables fundamental and technical breakthroughs. Consider the laser, which was developed out of a desire to control light, or more generally, electromagnetic radiation. Light is emitted in many processes, but in the 50s, Nobel Prize winning physicists learned how to use mirrors to capture light and make it bounce back and forth many times through the original source of that light. This stimulates the source to emit light of a single frequency or color in a very well-defined direction. This control over light is at the heart of many applications of lasers, from DVD players to fiber optic telecommunications. The laser also became a powerful tool for controlling the other internal constituent of atoms, electrons. Light from a laser can change the orbit of an electron as it moves around the nucleus. By promoting electrons to orbits that are very insensitive to the environment, it becomes possible to use the electron as the pendulum of an incredibly precise clock that won't lose or gain a second in the age of the universe. This sounds a bit like overkill, but it's actually very powerful for things like precision navigation. More recent research, including my own, focuses on the motion of atoms as a whole, in particular on slowing them down or trapping them. Slowing down a collection of atoms is equivalent to reducing their temperature. Atoms and molecules in the air around us, even on a cold day like today, move at the speed of a fighter jet. But at a millionth of a degree above absolute zero, they move at the speed of an ant. Surprisingly, atoms can be cooled with lasers. Usually, we think of lasers as heating. But with the right tricks, this heating can be avoided, and atoms become sensitive to the fact that light carries momentum and can push on things. If, la if lasers illuminate an atom from all directions, whichever way that atom moves, it feels a laser beam pushing it back and slowing it down, as if it's walking through molasses. 
The invention of this laser cooling earned another Nobel Prize in 1997. Such slow-moving atoms are at the mercy of a control freak like an atomic physicist. They can be trapped in the focus of a laser beam and moved around like an optical tweezer. They can be arranged in perfect crystalline lattices formed by the interference of multiple laser beams. When a large number of atoms are held in traps like these, they can be further cooled by simply lowering the strength of that trap to let the most energetic atoms escape. This has allowed us to create what may be the coldest stuff in the universe, and the current record is less than a billionth of a degree above absolute zero. At these temperatures, atomic, mo atomic motion comes to almost a complete standstill, and some types of atoms will undergo a phase transition to something called a Bose-Einstein condensate, in which atoms lose their individual identity and behave more like waves than particles. People have exploited this to make lasers out of atoms instead of light, and this work earned another Nobel Prize in 2001. Just this month, the most recent Nobel Prizes in physics were announced, and it was again given to two atomic physicists, and the citation read, for inventing and developing groundbreaking methods for measuring and manipulating individual particles while preserving their quantum mechanical nature. In one experiment, a single atom was given a split personality so that it existed in two different places at the same time. This is analogous to Schrodinger's famous thought experiment in which, according to the weirdness of quantum mechanics, a cat could be both alive and dead at the same time. By splitting the atom farther and farther apart, we can look to see when the atom chooses to be in one place or the other. And by this way, we can hope to better understand why we don't see quantum effects like zombie cats in our everyday lives. We continue to develop new ways to control atoms and light. Many, like me, engage in this pursuit because of its power to push back the boundaries of knowledge of the world we live in. Others are driven by technological advances that come from it. All would agree that this powerful idea has guided research for close to a century and will undoubtedly lead us in many new amazing directions in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Tom. And that was right on time, so we're doing well. So our next speaker is Elaine Howard Eklund, and she is Associate Professor of Sociology, Director of the Religion and Public Life Program. I neglected to state Tom's affiliation as Chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. But she is speaking on mentoring. Elaine. I feel like we're in a race. <laughs> a concept, a gift, a practice, a research topic and an idea that has engaged me is mentoring. I will argue that mentoring well is the most important task of the academy today. Now the what, why, and how of mentoring. What is a mentor? I draw from education scholars Anderson and Shannon's definition of mentoring as a nurturing process in which a more skilled or experienced person serves as a role model, teaches, encourages a less skilled or less experienced person for the purpose of promoting the latter's academic and personal development. Why is mentoring important? Researchers who study mentoring in the academy, as I have done recently, find that being in a relationship with an individual mentor increases productivity, self-efficacy, and professional development among graduate students and young academics. And according to the National Academies, when faculty apply for research funding, Groups that are unlikely in other circumstances to get funding, such as women, for example, who have mentors have a much higher probability of receiving grants. Mentoring is also part of the pragmatic future of the academy. The work that we do as scholars, although vitally important, is temporal and limited. Mentoring allows us an audience and an influence to carry on vitally important intellectual traditions and ideas far beyond the audience and influence of today. Yet in data from a study I'm conducting with Ann Lincoln on perceptions of women in academic science, nearly half of those in the disciplines of biology and physics at top research universities say that they did not have a mentor as an important part of their academic lives. Why don't we mentor more and more effectively? From my own reflection, we do not mentor for two key reasons. First, it involves risk. 
We're in a university environment that is fundamentally at risk, more competitive than ever for individual scholars and under more scrutiny than ever by the general public. Developing individual relationships with our students and junior scholars takes time. Time that we're often feel pressured could be better spent elsewhere. It's a long, long-term investment that cannot always be realized in the next publication, and it may never pay off in those outcomes. Second, mentoring is often perceived as care work. For some, mentoring perceived as care work that is less valuable than other types of scholarly work. Those of us who do research on gender in the sciences, for example, find that women are more likely than men to spend more time with students, have more mentoring relationships, and this time spent can actually take away from scholarly productivity. But a paper I'm writing with Rice undergraduate Kelsey Pedersen and postdoctoral fellow David Johnson, we find that men and women at top research universities essentially want the same things from a mentor, and that in particular, that women who succeed have been mentored well by both men and women. How then ought we to mentor? We ought to be concerned about encouraging mentoring by all and for all. On the one hand, our research shows that men and women who've succeeded in science have been helped by excellent mentors regardless of the gender of the mentor. On the other hand, our research also shows that women and those from underrepresented minority groups are in vital need of role models and mentors, those that show them success for them as possible. And even more fundamentally, mentoring is expanding rather than simply reproducing intellectual traditions. Knowledge isn't embodied in person. Deliberately helping an individual learn scholarship and succeed in the academic world does not merely mean developing clones of the primary scholar. That is an older and antiquated tradition of academic mentoring. Expanding intellectual traditions is a reflexive process that would mean teaching a tradition of scholarship while listening to the critique and reflection on that scholarship by the individual being mentored. It would mean helping the individual meet her potential, even if it is different from the trajectory of the mentor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. And that is, if anybody needs an extra minute, Elaine has bequeathed one to you. <laughs> so wow. thank you. Our next speaker is Paula Sanders, Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Dean of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies and Professor of History, talking on thinking with history. In 1995, I spent several weeks working in libraries in Cairo while waiting for my security clearance which would allow me to work in the Egyptian National Archives. As often happens, fellow researchers and I chatted about our work. One of my fellow researchers was a young Egyptian architectural conservator, and when I told him about the chapter I was writing on how to read medieval buildings as texts, he replied quite matter-of-factly, you know, they were all heavily restored in the 19th century. This is what we refer to in my business as an oive moment. <laughs> and it was painful, because I loved that medieval Cairo. From that moment on, I had to begin to reimagine these medieval monuments as part of the living, vibrant city of Cairo in the 19th and 20th centuries. And an entirely new set of concerns began to crowd out my original questions and assumptions. But I still didn't really know what to do with my new questions, or how to reframe my project. Several years later, Carl Shorsky's Thinking with History was published, and it transformed me as a historian. Shorsky explains to us that thinking with history, and I quote, is not the same thing as thinking about history as a general form of meaning making. Thinking with history implies the employment of the materials of the past and the configurations in which we organize and comprehend them to orient ourselves in the living present and in the future. And so I began to think with history about medieval Cairo rather than think about the history of medieval Cairo. And this led me to a new way of understanding so-called historic cities in general and Cairo in particular. By thinking with history, I began to see that the process of creating a historic city involves as much erasure as it does preservation. Deletions as well as additions may no longer be visible to observers 
even shortly after the work is completed. It is easy under those circumstances to take for granted that the historic city of Cairo is, indeed, a medieval city that has been preserved largely as it was in the Middle Ages. When we speak of medieval Cairo in this way, we are making the implicit claim that it is this rather than any other version of medieval Cairo that is authentic. But thinking with history impels me to think differently about authenticity and to argue that this particular version of medieval Cairo, the one that was produced in the late 19th century and canonized in the 20th century, has an authenticity that is equally rooted in its deep origins, in the changes that took place in the city over many hundreds of years, and in the specific historical circumstances from which it emerged in the 19th century. Thinking with history about conservation in Cairo means that I've tried to emphasize the historical contingencies in the plural of medieval Cairo, to ask why this city was so readily and easily canonized, to wonder why this version of medieval Cairo was and remains persuasive, and to question the assumptions about medieval Cairo with which I originally came to my first project, but which did not hold up in the face of rigorous historical contextualization. The medieval Cairo that I still love is no longer the historic city, a collection of monuments preserved and frozen for us in time, one in which so many rich pasts have been obscured, but rather the historicized city, dynamic, fluid, changeable, and changing. By historicizing this medieval Cairo within different and larger frameworks, we can see the assumptions and practices that left their impression directly or indirectly on the city and that continue to inform our sense of Cairo, its heritage, and its historic value into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. Our next and last speaker is Mark Embry, Professor of Computational Applied Mathematics and Director of RCEL, Numerate Citizenship. I grew up in the golden age of personal computers. One December night when I was seven, I came home from Cub Scouts to find my dad underneath the television set attaching a computer. This was not the Atari 2600 game console that the early adopter kids in the neighborhood had. This was its awkward older brother, the Atari 400, with its membrane keyboard and eight kilobytes of memory. When you turned it on, it booted to the basic language and gave you a prompt and invited you to program. I was instantly and permanently hooked. Of course, you could also insert a cartridge and play computer games, and alas, I did do this too. Uh, but those primitive early computer games, things like Missile Commander and Pac-Man, were inspiring to a young programmer. One could imagine the logic that governed them and readily hope one day to improve them. Soon computer classes sprung up in our elementary school, and even the cool kids liked to code. How empowering to tell a machine what to do. My lame attempts at text-based games soon lost their shine, though, and I became fascinated with using the computer to model satellite orbits. I didn't have a name for it then, but I'd fallen hard for mathematical modeling and scientific computing. My field is founded on the belief that the world can be sketched to various degrees of precision with mathematical models, and while these structures often defy clean solutions, they can be simulated with amazing speed and accuracy using carefully crafted computer algorithms. Those early computer classes taught us algorithmic thinking as kids, how to break problems apparently beyond our reach into bite-sized pieces we could tackle, then to design computer programs that we could implement using loops and subroutines. But I'm worried. A generation later, computer class still exists in our schools, but they have devolved into something very different. My children are intellectually handicapped by the expansive sophistication of our modern machines. Computer class now means learning office productivity software like PowerPoint and Word. Our elementary schools have little programming, no algorithmic thinking. We train a generation of users, not creators. This problem echoes in our high schools and colleges. Even with jobs in computer science booming, the College Board abandoned its top AP computer science exam in 2009 after five years of steadily declining participation. 
Having slipped from the core curriculum, computing is the domain of an elite few, with the balance of society at the mercy of the products and models that they create. Just as poets negotiate with form, words, and sound, developing refined approximations to the human condition, applied mathematicians build equations and models, inspired by the possibility of describing something not previously understood. At the same time, we are humbled by the knowledge that we only create approximations, knowing that our results can be misused by those that apply them blindly or with an agenda. In 1960, the physicist Eugene Wigner famously described the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences, the idea that models that originate from fitting experimental data often have astonishing predictive power. Look at the Higgs boson. Extrapolating, mathematical models have evolved from merely describing our world to now governing it. From personalized movie recommendations to the foundations of our financial system, models touch an ever-expanding portion of our lives. But I'm troubled by two significant challenges. First, the codes and equations that control our world are beyond the grasp of the bulk of society, which has not received much, if any, algorithmic training. Moreover, we have elected representatives who also lack an understanding of these models, with only about 2% of US Congress having a background in science and engineering. Such officials can struggle to detect the limitations inherent in this technology and miss opportunities to apply it for the greater good. The second major challenge stems from the insular nature of my profession. Too few American scientists and engineers have answered the call to elective office to contribute a sober and rational voice to our public discourse. The mathematics community itself has fallen short. Our professional societies train their ethical lenses upon plagiarism in academic journals while we turn loose into the workforce a generation of students equipped with excellent quantitative skills but no formal sense of professional virtue. These students have such great potential to do good and as educators we must, not, we must supply them not only with tools but also teach them how to justly use them. My passion then is to address these two problems to spur a broader audience to think algorithmically, and to educate burgeoning mathematicians to model the world with integrity. What a great privilege it is to share with students the tools that have captivated me since I first programmed that Atari and the attempt to educate a generation of numerate leaders. <laughs> And there was the bell. Thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. In fact, I want to thank all four of our speakers for brilliantly encapsulating an idea and developing it in exactly the prescribed amount of time. Uh, this is a wonderful skill, and we're grateful to you for taking the work, the time to do it and share it with us and make these important ideas so accessible to all of us. So now, you're all probably wanting to stand up and move and get warm. We have wonderful spanakopita and empanadas over there and various great uh, things to eat and drink. So please uh, share with us and chat with us and we will look forward to seeing you next semester. Thanks. All right. This program is protected by copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice University Digital Media Services.